Hey everyone, so we already have a review up of the Lian Lee Galahad liquid cooler, including the 360 and the 240. Today we're gonna be taking apart the 360. So before the review, we did not disassemble it, obviously, because it still works. But this is unfortunately, from what I'm seeing right now, going to be probably a destructive teardown, meaning we won't be able to reclaim it when we're done, but we'll at least be able to learn how it works and if it's different from some of the other ones we've taken apart recently, like the EK AIO, the NDXT X63 series with an Acetec Gen 7 pump, and then the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. So for all the performance of this cooler, noise, thermals, everything else, you can check the review for that. But in this, we're strictly focusing on build quality and assembly quality. We had some fit and finish issues that we point out in the review, like this scuff mark up here on the cold plate of our 360. We also had the magnet fell out of the cap that goes on top of the Lianli nameplate. So they give you a magnetic circle you can put here to debrand it and the magnet fell out. But that's something that Lee and Lee fixed very early on. Our understanding is that that should not be an issue in retail units, and if it is, they'll replace it for you. So those are fit and finish things we point out in the review. The bottom looks like it uses Torx for almost every screw, except for these two, which are, uh, I'm not sure the name of this particular bit, so we'll get a close up, and you can tell us the name in the comments. I'm assuming the name of it is the, the FU bit, because we don't have anything, we have, hundreds of, of different tool uh, drivers and bits here and none of them fit. So that I'm gonna just probably hammer out or drill out. We were able to find one online, but we don't have it here. So we're just gonna, we're gonna make it work anyway. A Couple of other small things. So notice this while working with the brackets for uh, the CPU cooler for the installation, where when you line up the bracket and start to uh, insert for Intel or AMD. Sometimes you'll clip the plastic housing and this will actually bend like that. So not a big deal. You just kind of push the metal down and make sure it gets under there. But uh, a bit of the, the cheaper end of the plastic and it's sort of flaws or weak points shows there. But once it's installed, you won't see it. So perhaps an upside there. There's a bit of mechanical action on this and that you can rotate the pump cap to change the orientation of the logo. So that's something that we, we may learn more about as we take it apart, but uh, pretty simple otherwise. And then for the radiator, the only key things to point out would be this aluminum piece that Lee and Lee put on here. Uh, it's just screwed in with some Torx screws. That was their way of trying to add some flair to it. And then also down here, there's a, uh, a refill port that you could, makes it look kind of like a, a deep cooler or a cooler master supplier, but most of the suppliers, so it's not Ace Attack. Ace Attack's a major supplier. There's also Deep Cool, Cool It, Cooler Master, Apoltech, uh, Dynatron. Those are the major suppliers in the industry for liquid coolers. All right, let's start with the thing that's the easiest and the least likely to be uh, annoyingly difficult to do and take off just this aluminum piece and see if it's just a simple, it looks like it should just be the rest of the, um, the chassis for the radiator core under it but I'd like to just see that for sure. So this is a Torx 9, very standard size and computer parts these days uh, on the GPU side. No glue yet. And there's second one. Oh, that's unfortunate. Unfortunately, Keegan behind the camera was right, and there was already glue on the first step of our process. So just an adhesive pad there underneath. Just to hold it, I'm guessing, I have a feeling that with two screws, maybe it starts to sort of bend or warp upwards in some instances. You can see that potentially happening without the, the uh, adhesive there, but that's all it is underneath. So just a standard radiator. Not surprising, but wanted to check it out anyway and potentially reveals a future shortcoming of this thing 
once that adhesive dries, but at least now you know how to fix it. Okay. Actually, yes, that is exactly why they installed that thing. Because I can, I didn't push it down too hard yet to reseat the glue. So it's actually warping up a little bit in the top here. And uh, almost definitely that glue is in there just to keep it as flush as they can with age. Okay, enough of the radiator. That's simple enough. So this thing's going to be a pain. We've taken apart a lot of these just to give you a preview of what some of them look like. These are the bits and pieces of an NZXT Kraken series Acetec Gen 7 cooler. So Acetec is the supplier for, for the components. There's the impeller, there's the cold plate, and then the rest of this is just sort of the, oh, I'm throwing stuff everywhere. The rest of this is just the um, RGB LED, uh, like infinity mirror thing, and then the PCB. There's actually a couple PCBs on this one. There's the other one. So the PCBs for uh, for Ace Attacks pumps were not commonly allowed to be designed by the manufacturer. They were almost always designed by Ace Attack till about Gen 5 or so. Maybe it was 4 when NZXT started doing it. This is just the inside of the housing. There's some uh, some dried up propylene glycol in there. There's the uh, electromagnet and they're pretty simple designs overall. We've got teardowns if you want to learn more about those. Getting to the Lee and Lee one, I guess we'll start with just loosening these Torx screws. Is it Torx? There's nine also. Oh, maybe. Yeah, nine. Be careful not to strip it though. Not the Actually, never mind. It's completely irrelevant because I'm going to put a drill through the other one. So it doesn't matter. But if you're going to take it apart, be careful not to strip these. Now we get to the fun part. I don't think I can just shove that in there. So I think I'll try this first. So I'm just trying to make a, a dent in it so that I can then socket it for some grip to hit the flathead at an angle to turn it to the left. I've used this a lot to get stripped bits out, especially out of door frames, but that thing might be in there, uh, threaded in there too hard for me to, to get out using this method. That might be a drill, or I could take all these out and then use metal snips and cut around it, but drill is going to be kind of annoying. Okay, so this uh, this screwdriver seems to fit, so we're just going to try turning the bit out. Wow, look at that. That's how you're supposed to remove them. It's a lot of metal. Yeah. On the bit. That's enough for a scrap yard. Would you believe that? Look at all these fit and finish issues on this thing. I don't know really how to the best hold this. This is such a small thing to work on. I've turned it into a flathead. gonna snap. <laughs> when this screwdriver was made, I'm not sure that computers even existed, actually. <laughs> okay. So it's about 150 milliliters of liquid, which makes sense. 280s are often 100. So 240s, 280s, often 100. So that, that makes sense. There's no debris to speak of other than the plastic and metal that we've created. Let's bring it back over. OK, so just uh, six screws later, and you can be this far. Not sure why. I know you can buy those bits. It's late. We can't buy one. So 
Uh, I'm not sure why Leanne Lee, though, chose to use something so abnormal. It obviously is a deterrent to disassembling it, which is unfortunate because it just seems totally unnecessary. I mean, once you're at that point anyway, you probably want to take it apart for one reason or another. But anyway, there's a gasket right there. Very peculiar looking one. We'll look at that more in a moment once we look at the plastic inner lining. There's the cold plate. This is where we're going to learn more about the performance characteristics. So where's the, here's a Kraken one from Ace Attack. So any cooler that's supplied by Ace Attack Gen 7 will look like this one. You can see there's a significant difference in service area, at least that way, but uh, height matters as well. Okay, so the calipers work again. Uh, NZXT's via Ace Attack is roughly 24 by roughly, again, not, definitely not exact, roughly 29 and a half. Can I get a depth? Yes. By roughly 1.77 tall. So call it 2429, 1.77. This one, 1.95 tall. Let's just get another reading. Yes, still 1.95. 32.6 by 30.7. Now there's another factor too that we can't really measure, and that's going to be the fin density. There's fin pitch and fin density. Fin pitch is the angle of the fins. We'll try and get like as close up as we can on them for a macro shot, but it's the angle of the fins, and it's pretty much vertical on everything. But the fin density is, I mean, I could go count it in, in the close-up footage and approximate it, but uh, we can't really easily measure that. It looks like more surface area. That would make sense. The Kraken series is a bit anemic compared to the modern generation coolers. Ace Attack has fallen way behind. Part of that's because they've sat on their patented design for so long that everyone else has out-innovated them out of necessity. And so I guess Ace Attack uh, th this point is, is, is getting what it dished out, but looks to be more surface area. Pretty confident that it is other than the, the, the density of the fins. And ultimately this would be a large part of the reason other than pump and fan differences, but a large part of the reason that modern coolers are outperforming the older Ace Attack stuff. It's interesting that there's a large gap. So the Ace Attack designs slope right next to the fin stack and for water guidance. This has just got a large flat piece right here. So I think you've got kind of an accept and a reject or something set up where uh, maybe that's to leave room for the, for the water to escape. Let's see. Let's see what it lines up with. If only we had an easy way to line up how it went, like a giant gaping Pac-Man shaped hole. Uh, so that, uh, Larger gap aligns with this side. And then this will socket in, I think. Yep, that socket's in like that. So this actually has some bumps in it. I'm not sure if it's just for the, the assembly team so that they can easily line it up the way it's supposed to go. Or if it's functional, I think it's just to line up because they sort of socket into the plastic. They don't do anything once they're in there. Uh, and then you have that piece right there is going to sit on top of this wider gap in the copper. Then the thinner piece will sit in the thinner gap. And it looks like, is the water coming from straight down? Is it split flow or is it something else? Water is coming from straight down right there. Actually, there's, there's something right there too. So I don't have to look closer. But we've got water coming through here and then maybe an outtake there, which would explain the design setup. Definitely cool to see new designs. And uh, Ace Attack for sure has forced everyone into it at this point. So this actually just pulls out at this point to get rid of the chassis. 
Okay, easy enough. Wonder what all the metal shavings are in there from. That's weird. Bad design. <laughs> I feel like I need to clarify because somebody in this video is going to freak out and think their cooler is filled with metal. We did some things earlier in this video. I think those things led to all the metal shavings in there. Okay. Hopefully. So there's our PCB. These are not too exciting. Uh, PCBs are fairly standard on all of them. There's, it's just some, there's some firmware on it, and uh, there's often PWM or just DC for this one, for the pump, and then you've got your LEDs here. So, so then they've got the motor soldered in there. You can see the electromagnet, the three wires. So at this point, you would be breaking it anyway. You'd, you'd ideally desolder these three points, then resolder it if you're going to rebuild this thing for some reason. But um, anyway, that's just from the copper wiring on the electromagnet. Okay, a ton of, uh, ton of screws up here. So these are all Torx 9. And take all these out and then that'll open up the rest of the chamber. So these screws are different lengths. Not that it particularly matters, but you can see which ones are longer anyway. It's the ones lining up with those are going to come down here into the bottom part of the chamber. Very annoyed that Lee Lee put those screws in there. These coolers are normally pretty easy to maintain with age. Uh, you might need to add more liquid if the permeation gets bad. You could even replace the pump though fairly easily in a lot of these if the parts are easily accessible. It's just taking it apart. You'll need to buy that bit. Okay, there's the impeller. And the gasket. All right. So impellers looking fairly standard for today's designs. So, uh, impeller, let's see. There's an Ace Tech one. They're not identical. Where's the EK one in this bag? EK, for comparison, is a very different setup for everything. So here's EK's impeller. Doesn't come with the screws on it. There's part of it. So there's this interesting, massive design. Uh, dealing with the patents as well. That's it. So here's EK's cold plate. We'll have to pop Arctics up on the screen as well at some point, but EK does run taller fins than anyone else right now that we've worked with anyway. So they're at 2.7 millimeters ish. Yeah, 2.7 again. And then 34, 30 and a quarter versus what was it? 33-ish, yeah, 30-ish, 31. And then that was like 1.7. So EK is running a taller fin stack, but again, density matters too, and we're not measuring that. I think Arctic's impeller looks like this. We'll pop it up. Couldn't locate it, but uh, we'll put theirs up side by side with this one. Ace Tech's old Gen 3 impellers were very different from all of these. They had a three-pronged plastic yellow impeller. Not impressive, but they've since moved to that design, and other people are moving to similar designs. And internally, we've got another gasket just for leak prevention, and the chamber that the water eventually goes into. So I think they're calling this a triple chamber design. Uh, it looks like maybe one. That looks like maybe one, unless it's, is it part of the same? Yeah. So to me, that looks like one chamber, not two, but anyway. And then they've got the one in the bottom. I don't know if they're counting the middle or where exactly the third chamber comes from. I think they have an explosion diagram showing it. But either way, that's what it looks like inside. This uh, is filled with copper powder, but that's not Lian Lee's fault. There's another screw in here. That looks like another Torx 9. 
Yep. We've got propylene glycol all over, so getting slippery, but propylene glycol mixtures typically are in the range of 20 to 30% glycol, and then the rest is the uh, distilled water. Okay, I think that's the intended disassembly method. Well, <laughs> that's it, it's just the rotation. There it is, there's a the diffuser. So that's what's giving you their LED look, all those holes. That's a big diffuser. LEDs are coming all the way up, I think, from this thing, and eventually through that, getting diffused. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 ish LEDs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. That's the whole thing. So there's definitely some cost in this piece because uh, that's some some nice aluminum. So machined aluminum piece, that's not cheap. And then this is just a uh, piece of plexiglass and then you've got just plastic everywhere else and a magnet right there actually. So that's what I'll secure to the magnet uh, thing that debrands it that sits on top. So biggest takeaway then is again going to come down to the cold plate, which is large. EK is pretty comparable. AS Tech getting left left way behind at this point in the charts as well and in some comparisons like the X72s and CLC 360, which gets the added benefit of its weaker fans for the CLC 360, but that's a, a main I think talking point for the Galahad cooler. So that's it for the Galahad. Not just the video, but the cooler itself. Uh, yeah, so we typically try to keep one unit disassembled at all times from each of the major suppliers. And in this case, this will be Leanne Lee's one unit that we keep dis disassembled. We do that because once again, as you saw in this video, it allows us to continue comparing the internals of things over time so that we can do something with a teardown other than take it apart. That way we can try to start understanding what is it that contributed to the performance that we saw in the review? And this one had overall pretty good performance, very competitive in general, but the new cooler is the suite of them. So there's an Arctic liquid freezer series, there's the EKIO, and now the Galahad. That group of three seems to be doing pretty well when compared to older generation designs, and we start to see why that is today. If you look at just the cold plates alone, for example, the rest of it's fairly Straightforward, the two bits that they use to secure the cold plate to the bottom are unnecessary and obnoxious, but otherwise nothing really crazy that we found in the process of taking it apart. The impeller is similar to other ones we've seen, a little bit larger than the impeller that's used on the new Gen 7 Ace Attack pumps. Uh, similar, if I remember correctly, to Arctic's, couldn't locate it for this, and then EK remains different from everybody's because they're sort of using custom cooling parts that they've crammed into an AAO, but we talked about that in that teardown. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to buy a mod mat like the one we worked on for this review, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.